Hello, my name's Jules. Welcome to The Secret Mind. This is a quick one because I need to do a video today. So this is a hypnosis video. It won't be of any interest to you. Um, it won't be of any general interest, maybe. It might not even be of that much interest to hypnotists. Um, so feel free to switch off now. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Um, apologies for this. I don't think it looks cool. I'm in a play. All right. So um, I've been growing it now for 15, maybe 20 minutes. Coming on, actually rather well. Uh, we're going to talk about this. Scoring clients. Now, I realised when I put that on, we're not talking about that at all. We're not talking about getting clients. We're not, it's not that sense of the word scoring. We're talking about symptom scores, putting scores on the symptoms so that you can prove your intervention has changed those scores and you've actually made a difference and you're not just kidding yourself. I'm not just kid kidding myself and we're all just living a ridiculous dream. <sighs> Would it have killed me to turn the sound off that phone? No. Um, and we're all just living in a ridiculous dreamland uh, and not really achieving anything. So to do that, you need evidence. And um, one of the ways traditionally you do in medical research, I'm a medic, doctor, medical doctor, uh, is you have to do scoring systems. You have to have validated systems to show that the second score was an improvement on the first, before and after an intervention. It's got to be validated. It's got to be done fairly rigorously. And... Um, it requires a bit of thought. Now, traditionally in hypnosis, if it's done at all, it's a scale of one to 10. On a scale of one to 10, how heavy is this? How do you feel is this? How is your fear? How is this? Mm. And that's fine, but it is, it's about as low rent as you can get, except doing nothing at all. Of course, it's subjective. That scale, if ever it's used, needs to probably be defined. If, for example, you do that with pain, as you do clinically, uh, use a scale of uh, 1 to 10, you need a spiel. So um, I'll give you my spiel for the 1 to 10 pain rating because it, in the hope of preventing everybody with any pain at all, saying, it's a 10, and sitting there calmly and blankly looking at me, I'm thinking, right, well, I've seen people in the 10 and they don't look like you. So this is about their method of communication, how much intervention or your attention they want or need. Um, and you have to take that with a pinch of salt when you know it's not a 10. OK, you can say it's a 10 to them. Fine. But the scale's out of 10. 10, I'm going to predefine them then, is like ha having your arm sawn off with a rusty blade. Oh, we're getting the hang of it. Zero is actually a little bit more difficult to define. So I usually go, and one is next to nothing. So we're really down at this. Now they've got these two extremes in their mind, and they can start to score with, hopefully, some level of common sense um, that they've just been given if they didn't have it before. So uh, now in hypnosis, what's the difference? Why aren't we doing that? Those of us who trained with the Bandler School of NLP, we've seen the likes of... Uh, Paul McKenna come on stage and you can see this on television clips and stuff like that where he'll get people in front of the stage and he'll ask you how is that fear now it's a five and how is that fear now uh, it's still a five tell me when it's a two and he'll just wait as these guys essentially humiliate themselves in front of a room with 500 people and they'll go it's a two eventually they'll go you just gotta wait is that really a two probably not does it matter well, it might or it might not. If they say to themselves it's a two, that might have, uh, that might be a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. The trouble is, the anaesthetist might actually believe it's a two when he's told it's a two. I say the anaesthetist, sorry, I mean uh, the hypnotist in that case. The anaesthetist might as well. Um, so there's a danger then of believing your own press because these possibly are when people are socially you know, bullied really into lowering their scores um they're not fully invested at that point now it may be that if you can force them to say it then it'll become it i do get that but be careful with that sort of bravado most of the people who teach hypnosis uh have a swagger uh 
it certainly requires bravado in when hypnosis is performed within stage hypnotism and within magic as it often is um it doesn't necessarily require that um clinically but there may be situations where the magicians get better results than you might if you don't adopt that it's not to your taste it's probably not to mine taste it may be to your taste of course but be careful anyway we should be scoring now if you're going to score and you're going to do it to a medical standard this is the sort of thing you're going to be coming across so let's have a look at this uh, mm -hmm. this is something i was looking at for a needle phobia this is the medical fear survey i've just picked a couple of surveys after a quick google and this is what you're going to either give to your client or go through it with them you'll notice it's pretty direct it's sort of dramatic but also fairly boring um and uh, it goes on a bit so uh the medical fear survey here the following situations are known to, uh, are known to cause some people to experience fear and apprehension please rate from zero of no fear or concern from one to mild fear two considerable fear three intense fear and you go through this is just page one you go through 20 of these things cutting with a hunting knife uh, I, I assume this is American I'm not sure the British would really quite know what a hunting knife is but we've all watched enough episodes of American television to know that's a rites of passage for just about well at least it's a rites of passage for most TV series if not for most American children who live in the wild uh, seeing a small vial of your own blood how will that affect you observing someone chop with an axe feeling like you will faint how much fear or discomfort would you experience from feeling like you would fa faint on a scale of zero to three zero one two three a four point scale so that's quite and then you've got to refocus of course re -ask, how much fear or discomfort would you experience from feeling like you will faint so quite complicated language would you so sort of subjunctive conditional case feeling like you will faint so you're asking them to probably try that on for size and feel it and this uh, i think this one says um i'm not sure it specifies but we'll have a guidance for this survey maybe that'll be in the in the last week some of the people you're talking about will have very specific things they won't be related to these sort of things at all and some uh it they might be able to connect with the next one next question is seeing a small test tube of animal blood already that's like one of one of the previous questions but the difference is your own blood to animal blood interesting distinction feeling pains in your chest how much fear how much discomfort would you experience from feeling pains in your chest i mean you've got to read the question again i mean how much discomfort do you feel from discomfort it's um it's a difficult question that isn't it well it depends how discomfortable it is so um you have to look back at the question use the following scale to evaluate each situation of um if you are exposed to that situation at this time if you are exposed to it how much discomfort or fear would you fear from the pains in the chest how much do the pains in the chest scare you okay observing a surgical so scare you so that might mean how much does that contribute to what we're treating today or just in general how how scary do you find that there may be family history where they find where they find uh, chest pain scary maybe a relative had dreadful chest pains at an early age and some harm came to them or something you don't know um observing a surgical amputation that's already quite a difficult thing to bring up with somebody that you're uh about to do a session with so you've got to think think your way around these questions if you're going to use them and you may decide it's just too much it's just too graphic or you don't want to do it with them and help them explore the subtleties of the question you might just send it out to them beforehand or send an adaptation out of it while you find your own survey so seeing a mutilated body on tv i mean pretty graphic seeing a small bottle of human blood on tv these are interesting things you remember the cinema screen in, in hypnosis you can 
maybe that might be useful information for you. So what's happening here? We're actually accidentally getting useful pieces of information in our pre-talk that we can use in the hypnosis. You weren't expecting that. And if you didn't cover all these things in your, in your general discussion and rapport building, then you don't get to know that information, which means you can't use it. You can't optimize your treatment. The next one is, look at this. I mean, observing someone operate a power saw that may have little or nothing to do with a needle phobia or uh, a fear of uh, seeing blood, having blood drawn from your arm. So, okay, but that's two things there, isn't it? The blood and possibly the needle. What are they actually phobic of? Now, this isn't there to test that. This is just a standardized questionnaire to give you a scoring system. But it's possibly giving you new information. New information about what it is they're fearful of. There's no point in just dealing with the needle phobia if they've actually got a blood phobia. Which is it? What are you treating? Don't treat the wrong thing. Maybe both. Treat both of them at the same time. That's going to need to be included. Um, seeing a larger bottle of your own blood. Handling a butcher knife. I mean, it just gets more graphic. Handling an open pocket knife. That's useful information, though. Is it sharp things they're afraid of? Do you need to focus on that in your, um, in your session? Seeing the mutilated body of a dog that has been run over by a car. I mean, already this is... You're trying to get people you know, calm and settled and you're asking them to picture things like that. So you're probably going to find, my guess is, these, these questionnaires aren't necessarily for you. Then you might go and pick another one. Here's another one. The severity measure for severe phobia in adults. It's quite small writing. Um, at least it's shorter. Same idea, except another point on the scale. Zero, one, two, three or four. It's the usual sort of occasionally half the time, most of the time, all of the time. Um, and during the past seven days, um, have you felt moments of sudden terror, fear or fright in these situations? Have you felt anxious, worried or nervous about these situations? Had thoughts of being injured, overcome with fear or other bad things happening? Feeling a racing heart, sweaty, troubled breathing, faint or shaky? Felt tense muscles, felt on edge or restless? avoided or did not approach or enter these situations, moved away from them, spent a lot of time preparing or procrastinating about them, putting them off, distracted yourself to avoid thinking about them, needed help to cope with these situations like alcohol or medication, superstitious objects or other people. So that is at least shorter. It's a little less graphic. There may be something you can use there. And look, it may have also, if you've gone through that, given you um, other things going on if you know what they're relying on you may do hypnosis entirely content free fair enough but if you did know they're relying on alcohol or other medications that may be something you want to think about or talk about or address or find out what they are legal illegal you're not there to judge but this will be useful stuff if you're wanting to know about if you're in the business of changing brain chemistry you want to know how effective your treatments are for people who are on medication as opposed to if they're not. Are they better? Are they worse? Is what you do dependent on them? Who gets the credit if they get better? That medication or you? Just things like that, things to consider. So these are scoring systems. So, uh, And then you've got to, always got to read the rules of them. That's a 10-item that's a, a measure only for people over 18, 18 and over. Uh, so remember that this is what they're only validated in certain circumstances. Now, you don't, it doesn't really matter. You're not doing necessarily published research at this stage, but um, bear that in mind, um, particularly for the graphic ones. You're not trying to give people such a graphic in, in, um, image that they end up negatively hypnotized. Thinking of mutilated animals in road accidents. I mean, that's 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 not... Um, do no harm. Remember that one? Non-medics, do no harm. Primum non nocere. First principle of medicine. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's that. And it applies to the seven days um, before. And this is uh, 
a score that's been found to be reliable, easy to use, yeah, it looks a bit easier than the other one, and clinically useful to clinicians in these recognised field trials. So, you know, fair enough. Now, also bear in mind, this is not just a research thing, you might be able to use it to track change in an individual. That's really what is of value here. Or ad adapt it so that you have one that you use each time that suits you better than using some of the ingredients, maybe of both those or a bunch of others. I'm sure there's plenty of them around. Um, and find out what suits your style and what's, what gives you a, uh, extra information. So, um, consistently high scores on a particular domain may indicate significant and problematic areas that the individual might warrant further assessment treatment or, okay, your clinical judgment should guide your decision. But everybody can do this. Uh, I wonder if many people are. So, um, I'm a little bit sceptical about the 1 to 10 for all symptoms uh, when used in the NLP and hypnotherapy framework. I think it's um, pushed a little bit, but it's better than nothing. Uh, it's used as a sort of, um, used as a technique to train the patient almost in expectation as opposed to uh, take the information totally at face value. Am I talking nonsense? Comment. Uh, feel free to comment. There's a lot of work that um, needs to be done. I've not heard anybody particularly talk about this. So um, uh, that's that. So what conclusions can we make? Um, it's a bit of work. Um, are you willing to do the work if you're going to see clients? Uh, is it something you're willing to incorporate to increase the quality of your work? Will you make your own um, questionnaires that you can send out beforehand or go through with them if they're as complex as that? Because I don't think if anybody's seen uh, that level of research tool before, if they've never seen anything like that before, it's going to be um, a bit problematic to do. I think sometimes you've got to be talked through it. If you've got the time, you could find aspects that are useful. The responsibility. Is it your responsibility to do that? Is it your responsibility to yourself as a therapist? Is it your responsibility to your client or your patient? be able to deliver results that can be shown on paper as well as in real life. Is that reasonable responsibility? Would they expect to see their record of success or would that be, would a treatment normally be documented if it had made an improvement in medical notes? I hope it would. Um, of course, if you never see a client again, you never have any feedback, you never bother to ask, you don't know. If you don't see a client again, you should assume your treatment has failed, shouldn't you? I mean, you wouldn't just assume it had succeeded, would you? That would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? So you need evidence, you need information in order to not do that. The delta, so just to remind it, sometimes these forms can show you um, extra information that you weren't expecting. Just the way they've asked the question might reveal other aspects of the phobia, not just the blood, but the needle or the experience or doctors or nurses they might be frightened of. And you can explore that more. But really it's the change within a patient you're looking for, the delta, the change between the before and the after. So the aspects of these may be useful, not just as research tools in for publishing peer-reviewed journals, but for looking for the delta in your client and helping you make the change. So um, that's my other point. The, and the, uh, the evidence, being able to produce the evidence for your own sanity and being able to honestly confirm that what you're doing is making a difference and you'll be able to quantify that. Uh, even if you just simplify these symptom scores and just take the effort to do them. And as I said before, it also informs your pre-talk. So you may discover other, other things that you can focus in on, uh, that you can weave into your uh, metaphors of the, um, of the hypnosis uh, interaction that you're going on to after doing these things. So they're my uh, thoughts on that. Um, if it's of any value, it's not um, a uh, 
definitive or exhausting talk on uh, scoring clients. Um, but it's something to think about. If you've got anything uh, to uh, add or uh, comment on, please feel free to do so. Other than that, I'll see you tomorrow.